No, you know better than that. I like how one side is uh, uh, the virus is just going to go away, and the other side is we're going to shut it down. Right? I love the, the sides, right? And it doesn't matter what you line up on. But uh, I do want to comment this. I'm going to just vent here just a little bit. I, I vented to my wife about this the other day. Again, I won't name names. Um, but um, one of the ad commercials, which I know you guys are tired of, I'm tired of the two. But one of them, there's a line in one of the ad commercials that says there are no miracles coming. And I told my wife, and it's not, it, it, it paints a very bleak and hopeless picture. It's not meant to be that. It's meant to say, because there's no miracles coming, you need us in office, <laughs> right? I mean, do you want to live in a world where no miracles are coming, you know? And I told my wife, I'm like, just from a marketing strategy, that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. Whoever wrote that, edited, vitted, approved it, they ought to be fired because it's just, I can't believe you'd want that to be your message. There's no miracles coming. You know, I don't want to live in that world. I know you don't. And the fact of the matter is, for anyone who is a believer, the greatest miracle that will ever happen that you personally will experience is actually yet to come. And we're going to talk about that here in just a few minutes, all right? Um, you know, what we're going to kind of delve into today is something that... Um, are you still going to have problems in this world? Yes, but it'll put all the problems in perspective. Um, it'll give you a confidence and a hope that, again, that greatest miracle that's yet to come, that you'll experience, is coming, and we just want God to reveal himself in his word today like we read earlier in Samuel. So let me, we're, we're in these seven I am statements that are from the book of John. Um, just, just listen here before we get to verses in our text today. Um, one of the first ones we looked at, John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. So we come to him. He goes on to say, whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So we come to him. We believe in him. And then he said, I am the light of the world if you follow me. So come to him. Believe in him. Follow him. You won't have to walk in darkness. You'll have the light that leads to light. That's the first week we kind of looked at those two I am statements. And then we went on to uh, last week, yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. So again, he's our access to God. He's how we get to God in heaven. It's through him. And then he told us, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. Why is he the access? Why is he the gate? Because he gave his life. He took your place. So it's through him, and he has that authority as a result of that. And then uh, we briefly touched on last week a verse you all know that I quote many, many times. But John 14, 6, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except through me. So we know he is the way, and that verse is telling us he is the only way. All right? There is no other way. So today we get to one of the great I am statements of Jesus that's a culmination of really all those things. It's kind of the reason why all those things were said. It kind of all comes together. And I can just tell you before I even get there today, I, I, I love this today because even in getting ready for it, I'm like, okay, uh, I always love it when I think you're going to learn something new. And some of you, you, you've heard this before. Some of you, maybe you've never really been taught it. Uh, but it's just good, good stuff, and again, we'll get there, so I'm excited you're here, excited to get to show you this from God's Word, so um, again, it's, uh, it's going to put everything in perspective for you, all right? Before we get there, we're going to be in John chapter 11, it's going to be one of our I Am statements today, but before we're there, just to set the context, it's a passage you guys all know, I actually just preached out of this back in uh, Easter, uh, when we weren't open, right, as far as public worship. By the way, just so you know, unless just there's something beyond our control, we will remain open, right? So whether you're here, not here, that's fine. Watch online or come, but I'll be here, okay? 10 a.m. every Sunday. And so again, unless, unless the governor just literally puts a padlock on our door, we're going to be open, okay? So, um, it's the account of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And so 
Uh, let me just kind of recap it, uh, just to refresh your memory to get to where we're going. Um, Jesus uh, and his disciples are away on business, <laughs> business trip. He's on his father's business, all right? And um, word gets to him, a message gets to him that Lazarus, his friend, has died. Now, he could go visit Lazarus. We know he's Jesus. We've read about other miracles. And we kind of, you kind of expect Jesus just to go and heal him and keep him from dying, but he doesn't do that. He waits four days. And in those four days while he's waiting, and he's just, the Bible says, he's just a few miles from where Lazarus is, and it's his friend that Lazarus not only dies, but they've had the funeral. He's already in the grave, wrapped and anointed with spices and all that stuff, okay? He's buried. So after those four days, Jesus comes back, and this takes place. I'll have verses up here. Listen to these verses here, or you can read along with me. It is uh, John 11, verse 19 through 26. The Bible picks up and says this. says, Many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. This is Lazarus' sisters. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Mary's mad at Jesus, to be quite honest, right? <laughs> Martha goes out to meet him, though. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. There's your I am. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Listen, that's a tough ask for Martha, I think, from Jesus. It's a tough ask for you because it's, a, it's the same question that you and I are asked to believe today. Listen, that... Death isn't the end. There's life after death that a choice made in this present world affects the life in the world to come. That you can live forever if you believe in him and receive from him life that only he can give. That Jesus can do all this because of what he did there. So when Jesus asked Martha that question, I love the fact, though, Martha doesn't hesitate. Martha, if you don't know, if you really read and study Martha, it's just her personality. She's a very matter-of-fact person, you know. Um, and so in uh, John chapter 10, verse 27, I don't have it up here, I don't think, but she responds when he says, do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him, I've always believed you're the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who's come into the world from God. She believed. Now, Jesus goes on, as you know the story, raises Lazarus back from the dead, back from the grave, and he proved he had the power to do what he said he would do, and he proved he had the authority to do what he said he would do, and to take it one step further, raising Lazarus is an amazing thing. No one else has ever done that, other than there are people in the Bible, prophets, that think God gave power to do so. Um, if you want to get technical, all right. But um, no one's done that, and no one has ever brought themselves back to life, which is exactly what Christ did when he resurrected, right? No, I mean, no one's done that. Christ only has done that. He did that himself. He took back his life, right? He's got, again, all the power and authority. Well, that statement that I am, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live after dying. That's what we're going to talk about today. Right? That's, that's really what it all matters. That's what this is all about. Because you and I, you know, are going to die. Right? We might survive COVID. We might survive the election of 2020. We might survive the asteroid that's supposed to hit the day before the election, all these kinds of things. But at some point, physically, we're not going to make it, <laughs> right? I was talking to my mom yesterday. She had a, a friend um, from uh, 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 my brother's church there, and she was, um, I word, 106. And she just died. So that 
That means she was she was born in 1915. Now, she would have been little, but she made it through that first pandemic and a whole bunch of stuff. Right. You know, and again, believe her in heaven with the Lord right now. But uh, man, that's a lot of life. Right. Jesus makes this I am the resurrection of life. What what does that mean to you, to me? What does it matter? What's it about? What does he mean when he says that? What's he telling us? What's he teaching us? Again, he's always revealing himself by his word, right? So what does his word reveal to us when he says that? Let me read you some verses. I believe they'll be up here for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19 through 23. If our hope in Christ is only for this life, we're more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Just basically saying, look, all of you people professing to be believers, if it's only for this world, we got nothing, right? I mean, because let's face it, we don't have as much fun as somebody that doesn't believe, right? They can go do whatever they want to do, right? Um, we come to church and worship, you know, take time out of our day, uh, as you guys did, right? You, you, even though you slept in, you still got up and got here. People don't go to church, don't believe in Christ, they don't have to do that, you know? They don't have to have the inconvenience of being a believer and being guided by God, and that's not an inconvenience at all. I'm just, you know what I'm getting at. If that's it, if this is it, all we talk about and sing about and all these things that that motivate us and drive us, if that's it and it's just for here, what good is it? Verse 20, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of the great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. Again, Jesus, I'm the resurrection and the life. Verse 23, there is an order to the resurrection. So you guys are going to like this stuff because we're going to get into some details. All right. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. There is an order to the resurrection. We're going to talk about the resurrections. There is a first resurrection and there is a second resurrection. And you guys are going to find out because this involves this greatest miracle, which resurrection you're in, which one you want to be in, all right, and how this all works, how it's all going to gonna work. So, and some of you, it may be the first time you've heard it, some of you maybe heard it before, maybe you've heard it before and you still don't understand it, and listen, it's okay. <laughs> this all works out. This is all matter-of-fact stuff that whether you believe in it or not, it's going to happen. You just have to believe in him, all right? But the first resurrection, and let me clarify, this first resurrection, we're going to give you a lot of verses here and stuff. This is for all believers. So the first resurrection is all believers, okay? You put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you will take part in the first resurrection. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Again, verses you've heard before. This is read a lot of times at gravesides of saints and things that, again, are believers. It says this, it says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. Again, it's different, the funeral of a believer versus the funeral of an unbeliever, right? Verse 14, Since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. How about that? Now, all of the Bible is inspired and from God, but, but when, when an author in Scripture inspired by... when So God inspired all of Scripture, right? But then when he tells them, you make sure they know this is right from me. <laughs> it's all from me, but this is right from me. You know that's, hey, <laughs> you know, right? This is, you know, I know it's not to the level, but it's the same thing. It's like, who told you? Mom said, right? <laughs> if mom says, you know, dad doesn't even get that. Mom said, right? All right, this is directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns 
will not meet him, pay attention to this, not meet him ahead of those who have died. Again, I need you to understand there's order of the resurrection, and even within the resurrection, there's order. Okay? For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. That's believers that are buried, dead. Then together with them, we who are still alive, this is at, before, this is at the rapture of the church, before the tribulation, we'll talk about that. Those who are still alive, remain on the earth, will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. Verse 18, so encourage each other with these words. All right. We have two bodies. We have a physical body. We have a spiritual body. Two bodies. You have your body and you have your soul. All right. Two things. There are two deaths. There is a physical death. There is a spiritual death. You and I, believers, will experience a physical death. All right. That's going to happen. Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. Now, again, unless you're alive at the time of the Lord's appearing in the air when he calls up the church, which, again, church age saints is what it's talking about, um, again, you will not physically die at that point, right? Because, again, he's calling you up at that point. But we don't know when that time's going to be. Only God the Father knows, all right? So when you die... Your physical body's in the grave, it's in the urn, it's ashes spread wherever. Uh, you know, there used to, you know, people, you know, people didn't want to ever be cremated because they just thought fire, judgment, kind of things like that. And then they thought, well, um, I mean, I've heard all these arguments or debates before. It's like, well, um, how will I be resurrected if my if my body's ashes? Well, people, okay, listen, he he made Adam from the dust of the ground. All right. He knows how to work with ashes and dirt. All right, so you don't have to worry about how you're buried, right? There's a lot of people dismembered and all kinds of things, crazy, awful things happen to people. He can collect you, all right? It's okay. He knows what he's doing. He knows where things go, all right? Um, so the physical bodies in the grave are in ashes, however it is. Your spirit, however, is with the Lord. Okay, so again, I'm going to get real technical here because I think these are just, it's the practical things of how does this all work? And it's all in Scripture. It's talked about. Let me give you a verse. It's not up here, but Ecclesiastes 12, 7. For then the dust will return to the earth and the spirit will return to God who gave it. So the body goes into the ground, ashes, whatever, returns to dirt, the earth, but the spirit returns to the Lord. Again, talking about a believer. Okay, my wife and you know uh, obviously her grandfather passed away and, and that was you know a tough thing but it was a great glorious thing and the other day she came in she bought a Christmas wreath and you know she's been to the graveside many times so I just go and and sit there and she knows he's not there his physical body is there right but he's with the Lord his spirit's with the Lord okay. So that's what you just need to understand as a believer. Again, I'm talking about believers here in all this first resurrection. All right? So hang here with me. I think I might have these verses up here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. We know that when this earthly tent, talking about this body, we live in is taken down. <coughs> excuse me. That is when we die and leave this earthly body. We will have a house in heaven, an eternal body, made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies. Anybody tired? I mean, you got an extra hour. It does, it's not enough, is it, people, right? I mean, you know, I got up having slept a long time, and it's like, uh, right? I want more. I want to fall back some more. We grow weary in these present bodies. We long to put on our heavenly bodies. Hey, you got a wonderful new physical body waiting for you in heaven that's going to be awesome. It's going to be Avenger, Marvel, superhero life, right? That would be cool. 
It's waiting for you. We long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. We will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. That is meaning when we are united with our glorified body, we won't be spirits. We'll be spirits with bodies. Okay? Verse 4, we live in these earthly bodies. We groan inside, but it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. I love the fact that it says swallowed up by life. Swallowed up by I am the resurrection and the life. Right? That's who you and I as a believer get swallowed up by Christ. Verse 5, God himself has prepared us for this and as a guarantee, he has given us the Holy Spirit. That's why the moment you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells you. It's, it's God's mark. It's God's sign. You are one of his. Okay? As an example, that's the thief on the cross. One of the thieves on the cross got saved. What did Jesus tell him? Today you'll be with me in paradise. Now, his body was on the cross. He actually died after Christ physically died. Remember, they came, they took Jesus' body down. They were actually amazed that he had died so quickly, but he had died so quickly because he gave up his life, right? Again, as a sacrifice. At some point, that thief that had accepted him on the cross died. They took his physical body down. He probably didn't get much burial. More than likely, they didn't even bury him. They just threw him in the potter's field area and let him rot and decay. But his soul was with Jesus in paradise. Okay? All right. This 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, these verses that we read, or, or I should say the events um, that take place during that, that is the beginning, uh, it's the rapture that takes place at the beginning of the tribula tribulation, that seven year period, right, where it's just going to be horrible times of judgment and all kinds of things that happen, especially midway, at the end of that tribulation, Jesus Christ will come back, again, I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but believers that have died... Believers who are alive when Christ comes back in the rapture, all right, or at the rapture. Again, he doesn't physically come to earth. He meets those that have died and us that are alive, if we're alive, <laughs> together. And it says, then we'll be with him. Okay, then you have the seven years. Now, there's a little bit of dispute, not dispute, but differing beliefs of whether Old Testament saints also resurrect at that time when church age saints and um, um, people who are alive or it's it's at the end of the tribulation at Christ's second coming again doesn't really matter this is still all classified as the first resurrection okay so again it doesn't matter there's an order to it however it happens um, you want in that first resurrection. All right? All right. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 through 6. Look at these verses. Still talking about first resurrection. Then I saw thrones, and the people sitting on them had been given the authority to judge. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus for proclaiming the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his statue, nor accepted his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They all came to life again, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So it, you're going to have people get saved during the tribulation, the seven years. Those people, again, will be who have died, not taking the mark, because you either take the mark or you're dead. There is no other alternative, okay? And so those that don't take the mark that accept Christ during tribulation, they are also resurrected. It's made very plain there. Again, that's still part of the first resurrection. All right? It's all kind of called the first resurrection. Verse 5. This is the first resurrection. <laughs> it's made very plain for you. All right? There's an order to the resurrections. And within the first resurrection, you have these events happening, whether it all happens right before the tribulation or it unfolds as some at the beginning some at the end, and again, we know the tribulation saints, 
They have to go through the tribulation or they wouldn't be tribulation saints, but they get resurrected. All right. I hope I haven't confused you. I'm just trying to, you know, I'm giving you a whole lot in a short amount of time. Um, this is the first resurrection. The rest of the dead. Now listen, that's a key word. The dead. Believers are never dead because you have made alive in Christ. So this is not referencing any believer. The rest of the dead, which is again going to be unbelievers did not come back to life until the thousand years had ended. So we have the rapture, the seven-year tribulation. There's a battle, one last little battle, uh, Gog and Magog, it's called in Scripture. Revelation talks about it with Satan. That's quickly over before it even begins. And then, um, you've again, you've had the thousand-year reign. And I'm sorry, I'm getting a little mixed up here. I apologize. You've got the rapture, you've got the seven-year tribulation, you've got the millennial reign. It's after the end of the millennial reign you have the battle of Gog and Magog, which is quickly over. And again, again, as you have here, it's saying the rest of the dead did not come back till life until the thousand years had ended. So that millennial reign is when the dead are resurrected. We'll get there. Verse 6, blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. For them the second death holds no power but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with them a thousand years. Okay, so before we get to the second resurrection, you as a believer will experience a physical death unless, again, you're alive when Jesus comes back in the air and you're caught up in the air. It's the only other way you're not going to die, okay? You and I as believers will come back and rule and reign with Christ for 1,000 years on this earth. Okay? After that 1,000 years, there's a new heaven, new earth, all that stuff. Second resurrection. The second resurrection is experienced by unbelievers. You, I, anyone that is a believer will not experience the second resurrection. All right? We'll get to that. Um... So after that thousand years, um, again, I said there's going to be this battle of Gog and Magog. Literally, Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet. It's interesting that you have three. There was Satan. We talk about the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Satan has his own replica, false Trinity. He wants to be like God so much. God's got a Trinity. I want a Trinity. So Antichrist false prophet, Satan. They make up the false trinity. Again, this battle is nothing. He gathers all the nations of the world that are, again, against God, against you and I as believers. There's going to be this battle, and it's over before it even starts. And Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet are taken, and they are cast into the lake of fire, the Bible talks about, where they will be forever. All right? So Satan, all that, he's all done away with. But then we have this whole second resurrection that's after that. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. Look at this here. And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. The books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death, and anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Fire. Second death is that spiritual death that an unbeliever will suffer because they've rejected Christ. And there's no coming back from that. It's permanent. It's over. It's done. And listen, the sad thing is, hell was created for Satan, his demonic following. It was never created for a human. But because they reject Christ, that's where they're going to end up. Because, again, they really ultimately 
served and followed and worshipped Satan, the lie, rather than Christ. So everyone has a physical body and a spiritual. Everyone, there's two deaths. Everyone will experience the first death. It's appointed that a man wants to die, but that second death will be experienced by someone who never accepts Christ as their Savior, never has a personal relationship. You've rejected. So you, that person, that unbeliever, will experience a physical body death and then a spiritual death, the second death, and that will then be eternal because they will literally be resurrected to go to the great white throne judgment, the books open, and they're going to, you know, it's basically, obviously, uh, surmising here, okay, here's your life. Let's look at all the good. Let's look at all the bad. Let's see which one weighs more than the other. It's always, the bad's always going to weigh more. You can't be good enough. So they go through all those books, but then there's another book, which is the book of life. And that book is open. And really what it's saying is, you know, the good and bad don't matter. <laughs> this is why you're getting what you deserve. It shows. These books prove it. But if your name's in the book of life, mercy and grace stepped in on your behalf, right? That's why Christ came. He is the resurrection and the life, the book of life. And if your name is recorded in that because you've got a personal relationship with Jesus, these other books don't matter. Because again, you're saved by God's grace and mercy. But your name's got to be recorded in that book. And if you don't have that personal relationship, you're not in the book. And they'll open the book, and God will take a roll call and look for your name. And if your name's not there, you're going to suffer that second death spiritual, which again will last forever in a place of hell and torment forever and ever. And there's no getting out of it. It's what it is. That's why he says... I'm the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Hey, that's awesome news for you and I as a believer. Listen, this, however this life goes, whether you've got it bad or got it good or the hardships, whatever it is, it ends okay for you. It's going to be okay. Literally, you're going to make it. He will be the God that gets you through it all because you're one of his. It's, it all works out. You get to literally live forever even after having physically died. That's all still good, right? Because this is only temporary. The rest is forever, right? Everyone who lives in me, believes in me, will never, ever die. Again, he's talking about you'll never suffer that spiritual death because, <clears throat> again, you're alive in me. But again, those who haven't made the decision, they will suffer that second death. <clears throat> because when he asks, do you believe this? That person, that unbeliever is ultimately saying, no, I don't. I don't believe that. I don't believe you're the way to everlasting life. I don't believe you did what you said you did. I don't believe you came and died for me. I don't accept you as the son of God, right? That's not what God wants. He tells us all this stuff. And I know some of you may seem like, man, there's so much there. He tells you all this so that you will understand and believe it. This is what's going to happen. I'm going to ask you guys to close your eyes. I just want you to, I know it's a lot of info, a lot of facts and stuff, all great stuff for a believer. But listen, this is where you just say, well, how does this affect me? Well, it affects you. If you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you're going to be resurrected and you're going to live forever. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then your name is not yet recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. Your name's not there. The way for it to be there is to believe that Jesus came, he died for your sins, buried, resurrected, and listen, you simply call on him Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, the Bible says. 
The moment you do that, then your name's recorded in that Lamb's Book of Life. Your name will be there. And you won't suffer that second death. Listen, the other thing that I would tell you that this message, this word that God reveals to us, tells us is, you know what, listen, as bad as anything gets or whatever problems or anything you have, look, it, it's, it's all going to work out. Just trust me. Just trust me. He's there for you now. He was there for you then. He'll be there for you in the future. He's already got it planned out for you. You just got to trust him. Quit being stressed and worry and all those things and just trust him. He's got it. He'll get you through it all. Heavenly Fathers, we come before you. God, we thank you for your word. God, it's so very straightforward. Even the God, there's so much there to take in and digest. But God, we know your spirit helps us understand your word. We know you reveal yourself to us through your word. And God, let us just soak in it and take it in. And God, you just reveal it to us. And God, what you reveal to us, what your word says, God, we will believe. God, we thank you for your loving care for us. You're such an awesome God. We know that you love and care for us because, again, God, all that you have planned and prepared for us. Thank you for your goodness to us. I ask that anyone here in this place or watching or listening to God, if they don't have a personal relationship with you, God, they would call on you right now to, God, ensure that they experience that first resurrection. That, God, they're not here for the second. That, God, they don't experience that second permanent death. Love you and thank you. And ask us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing that last song.